Hello, welcome back. It's now time to complete our classification of the equilibrium points for 2D systems by dealing with some annoying special cases. But um, let's just quickly recap what we've um, discovered so far. So we've argued that for 2D systems um, about equilibrium points, we can approximate um, the solution with a linearization. So we can um, we have this delta x1 dot delta x2 dot is equal to some matrix A delta x1 delta x2 plus some extra stuff here that gets small as delta x um, gets very small. This shouldn't be a 2 sorry. Yeah, let's get rid of that. So we linearized our 2D systems to get something of this form and then began to understand um, the behavior around the equilibrium point by looking at the eigenvalues of the A matrix. And in particular, um, we said that if the eigenvalues of A have real part um, equal to zero, then we don't know. And um, we'll actually look in a minute as to why we can't possibly know. Um, and in fact, in this case, it's not possible to de uh, determine how the equilibrium point is going to behave just based on the A matrix. And then we um, sort of began to classify a bunch of um, cases. So if A has real eigenvalues, then we either got um, a saddle point or a, a node, yeah. Um, so, and this depended on how the eigenvalues were ordered. So if lambda 1 was bigger than lambda 2 was bigger than 0, we got an unstable node. If lambda 1 was bigger than 0, was bigger than lambda 2, we got a saddle point. And this was also a type of unstable equilibrium point. And then in the final case, um, both smaller than zero, we got a stable node. And then we also classified the um, case of complex. Um, so if A has complex eigenvalues, then if the real part of lambda 1, which must be equal to the real part of lambda 2, because they come in complex conjugate pairs, is bigger than 0, then we got an unstable focus, and then with this reversed so that we have eigenvalues in the left half plane, we get a stable focus. And the focus behaviors, they corresponded to spiraling into the origin. The nodes, there were two eigenvectors and one was fast, faster than the other one, and you sort of were put, you were shrunk along those two eigenvectors at different rates. And the saddle point you have one stable direction and one unstable direction. And um, so the rough shapes were unstable node. Uh, you had these two directions, say this. And along those eigenvectors, you just go out and then any other combination, you also go out, but maybe along different paths, depending on the speeds of the eigenvectors. That's where the eigenvalues. Saddle point. Um, you again had two directions, say this and this. One is stable, the other one is unstable, and in between you get an unstable behavior, something like this. And then stable node was the same as the unstable node, but with the arrows reversed. And finally, for the foci, you had 
uh, spiraling behavior. And if it's stable, it spirals into the equilibrium point, otherwise it spirals away. Uh, so what's left? What have we missed? Um, well, we can't deal with the zero um, real parts yet, but what about repeated eigenvalues? And that's what we're going to talk about now. So we've got two cases, uh, and this, this type of analysis is all, always really annoying. So we've got two cases to consider. Um, so these are the cases for lambda 1 is equal to lambda 2. And case 1, again, we're just going to illustrate it by an example. Let's say that delta x dot is equal to lambda lambda 0 0 delta x. So this is our A matrix. And there should be an approximation here because we've got some other junk up there. But OK, this is case 1. And the case, the case 1, um, if you want to understand this in full generality, occurs when the rank of the matrix lambda i minus a equals um, zero. So at the eigenvalue of question, um, this matrix here has rank equal to zero. The details aren't important. This is such an example. Um, and what do we get? Well, if this is our A matrix, then uh, we get that delta x1 of t is just equal to e to the lambda t delta x1 of 0. So in this case, our eigenvalues are both equal to lambda. And our eigenvectors are 1, 0, and 0, 1. And so our solution is given by this. And delta x2 of t is equal to e to the lambda of t delta x2 of 0. So what would this look like on a phase portrait? Well, we draw on our axes again. So we've got x1 and x2. Let's say this is our equilibrium point. So delta x is measured um, relative to this equilibrium point. And then we just say, OK, so let's say delta x is pointing out here. So delta x, this is delta x0. So it's equal to some vector in the direction. 1, 0. OK, so x1 is non-zero and x2 is equal to 0. So what happens? Well, the change in x1 will be given by e to the lambda t times wherever we started. So if lambda is negative, our solutions will tend in along this eigenvector. And similarly over here. Um, and if lambda is positive, they'll go the other way. And the same thing happens for the other eigenvector which is in the 0, 1 direction, it'll either be in or out. And everything in between is just a linear combination of these two things. So if we start somewhere over here, we get a behavior like this. So this is exactly like the um, behavior of the node. It's just now we have two eigenvectors that decay at the same rate. So if we start somewhere out over here, we get sucked into the origin at the same rate. And this is it's kind of like a node. Um, sometimes it's called a star, I think. Um, but we can understand that in the same way uh, that we could understand the node case um, over here. And again, you'd call this stable or unstable, depending on whether the eigenvalue is um, uh, negative or positive. So that's case one. That's very familiar. But then there is an annoying uh, second case. And this case corresponds to the fact when your um, A matrix only has one eigenvector. And I don't know if this is something that you've come across before, but it can happen. It's kind of pathological. Um, just a tiny perturbation to your matrix will push it into a case where it will have um, a full set of eigenvectors again. But um, technically, it can happen, so we need to cover it. And the prototypical example of this is the following matrix. So we have lambdas on the diagonal again. This is our eigenvalue. But we have a 0 here, and we have a 1 here. Um, 
And if you're interested in reading more, this, this is what's called a Jordan block. Um, and what does the solution like? Well, uh, first of all, what's the equivalent classification uh, to this? Well, actually, it turns out that in this case, the rank of lambda i minus a is equal to 1. This is another way of saying that we only have one eigenvector in this case. So what happens? Well, we can go away and mess around with uh, matrix exponentials. Again, it gets a bit more complicated this time um, because we don't have distinct sets of eigenvectors. We only have one eigenvector um, that actually corresponds to. Um, so our one eigenvector corresponds to um, this guy here. Um, and you go away, you do some calculations, and what you find is that delta x1 t is equal to e to the lambda t um, delta x1 of 0 plus t e to the lambda t x2 of 0. And I don't know if you remember, like all of those years ago when you were solving differential equations at school, there was that, always that annoying case where you had to start shoving t's into the solution of your second order differential equations, and that's exactly what's happening here. Um, and then similarly, we can find that uh, delta x2 of t is equal to e to the lambda, lambda of t, and then here we have delta x2 of 0. So this is our solution. Um, what does it look like? Well, it's very similar, but we just have to sort of fudge things um, in directions away from our one eigenvector. So let's draw on our axes again. So here we've got x1, here we've got x2. And if we take a step in our eigenvector direction, so our eigenvector direction is 1, 0, so just like last time, if that's our equilibrium point, we take a step delta x over here and we let the system go. Well, if x2 is equal to 0, then delta x1 of t is just equal to something that depends on x1 of t, and x2 of t is equal to 0. So we actually get exactly the same behavior that we had up here. So along our one eigenvector, we get the behavior of either going into the equilibrium point or being pushed away from it, depending on the sign of lambda in the usual way. Um, the problem happens when we consider the other directions. So let's take a small step up. And what do we get? Well, we get x1 of t goes like t times e to the lambda 2 times 1. And x2 of t, um, we get an e to lambda 2 of t. And if you go away and you plot these um, trajectories, you get something that looks like that. So that the key feature here is that we get sort of squished onto our eigenvector. We don't, whereas when we were looking at the nodes before, we would have some solutions sort of linking onto each of our eigenvector directions. Now we only have one eigenvector direction, so we, we end up getting squished um, onto that somehow, and we get some picture that looks sort of like this. Um, and other than that, everything is the same. And in fact, if we made an arbitrarily small perturbation, another eigenvector would appear, and we'd back, be back in our usual node case. Um, so this is what we have, uh, what we get when we have repeated eigenvalues. Um, so we either have this kind of perfect node behavior, or we get this weird uh, behavior when there's only one eigenvector. And now we've completed our classification of um, equilibrium points in 2D based on linearizations.